The following interview was conducted with Hanus Thompson, Professor Emeritus of Electrical and Computer Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, uh, November 17, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon, Thank Professor you. Thank Thompson. You very much. Let's tell us a little about where you were born and your parents in early years. Okay, I was born in Salisbury, North Carolina okay. in 1928 at the beginning of the Depression which uh, certainly shaped life around my neck of the woods anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my mother was a nurse, and I think at that time she finished the 10th grade and then went to nursing school, which was certainly more abbreviated than it is now. Uh, my dad uh, didn't finish high school. Uh, he went to work for the Southern Railway as a brakeman, and then when the crash hit, uh, he didn't have a job, like a lot of folks didn't have a job. So for the first uh, probably three years of the Depression, uh, he basically didn't have a job. And uh, he took whatever he could get as a day laborer for a dollar a day or less. And, uh, we squeaked by and then... Did your mother, was your mother able to continue working as a nurse? Well, just, just part time oh. because she felt that she ought to be home raising my sister and me, okay. just two of us. And about 1933, I guess, my dad got on as a meat cutter, or as the meat cutter of a little, I'll say mom and pop grocery store. It was a pop and the son grocery store. And uh, that provided a living, not, not a whole lot, but at least. And of course we had a had about three acres and we had a cow and we had, we raised a couple of hogs each year and that uh, of course gave us some meat. And we had a sizable garden and we sure. raised and canned a whole lot of stuff and so, uh, I learned to eat mush, not the pork type mush, though that was good too. Just a little <laughs> cornmeal and <laughs> understand <laughs> stuff like that. And then uh, when the World War II started, 1939, my dad was re-employed by the railroad, and so things looked up a little bit. We were able to get rid of uh, our ice box and get a refrigerator finally, and things like that. So, what was grade school and high school like down there? Grade school was interesting. The first uh, no. Second grade, I went to a grade school in the city of Salisbury, which was close enough to my dad's place of work that I could walk over there. Uh, and I had a combined second and third grade, which was interesting. And they worked out fine. Sure, I right. I've heard or others have experienced the same similar okay. thing. And then uh, uh, they built a new grade school out in the county near me, and so we rode the bus for the rest of the primary up through seventh grade. Uh -huh. And then I went to high school in, uh, high, in Boyden High School, which was in Salisbury, North Carolina. And uh, I was one of the last classes to only have 11 grades. Uh, that was when they inserted the other grade and uh, finished high school in 1945. Uh, started college at North Carolina State University. Or North Carolina How'd you State. happen to select that one? Well, it was the engineering school. Okay, and this is what you're. And, and I was I was interested in engineering. Sure. So I started there in '45, and I did okay. But I uh, just honestly, I didn't apply myself as well as I should have. I was I was passing, but. Did you it, live on campus? Yes, okay. I did live what on was, campus. Tell us about what was campus like. And this was right after the war. Yeah, and I, I will mention it. There were thousands of. Oh, young yeah, men that. mostly coming back sure. from like war. Sure, like Purdue experience too. And, and there was a, what they call a vetville. They had a little place with, uh, you know, tar paper shack sort of things where veterans and, and their wives and family could live. And we lived in that later on, but uh, uh, that's, that's another part of the story. But uh, the, the dorm was nice. It certainly wasn't fancy by today's standards. Uh, you had a you had a bed and you had a closet and that was just about it. <laughs> <laughs> bare kid, bones. Uh, bare bones, and uh, at, tw towards the end, they were admitting so many students, so many returning veterans, that they realized when it was time for me to become a junior, that there was not lab space enough to accommodate all the rising electrical engineers, and what they decided to do was let go by GPA. And I think they had something like 600 rising electrical engineers, and they're only going to be able to take 100 into the upper division. And they would take them based on GPA. Well, I missed that cutoff by, I think, uh, 22 people. 
And, and that was okay. But they were going to have you take a program called Engineering General. Now, there used to be a general engineering program there and probably other places as well. But this was a mishmash. What they were going to do was let you take courses in which there was plenty of enrollment possibility. And I decided that I didn't, I didn't want to do that. So I joined the Navy in 1947. I joined for he three. dropped out of college. I dropped out of college. I joined for three years, uh, which was a, a great opportunity. I tried uh, to become a Navy pilot, an officer and a pilot, and the only thing that kept me from it was the color test. I can see colors, but you know the little charts they throw out for you with the spots on them that you're supposed to see numbers in? I never could see the right numbers for the most part. And uh, so I, I stayed in the Navy. I got a very good education in electronics and electrical engineering, which prepared me well for returning to college later on. And uh, uh, I was due to, this was June, I guess, when the Korean War started. I was due to get out in September. And Uncle Harry Truman extended the enrollment of everybody for a year, which, which turned out to be fine. And so uh, in 51, when I, four, just before I was ready to get out, uh, I married my now wife. And uh, Where did you meet her? Did you know her from home? <laughs> th this was an arranged marriage. Uh, <laughs> my, I was not going with anybody in particular. You know, I had yeah, girlfriends occasionally. Sure. But my aunt in Salisbury, my father's sister lived about three blocks from who is now my bride's mother and she sent me a picture of this young lady and said I think you ought to get in touch with this girl <laughs> <laughs> so and that she that predate or, or e-harmony or whatever right yeah, yeah. and uh, she my, my wife Fran was going to Meredith College an all girls school there in Raleigh and so I'd stop I'd drive down on the weekend and see her but uh, make a story short, uh, we were married on the 12th of August in 1951, and I still had uh, two weeks to finish up, and so we had our honeymoon, and we drove back to uh, the Tuxet River Naval Air Station, Four years. You know, where I'd been stationed for about three years, and then uh, I re-entered North Carolina State that fall, and uh, being a little older and married made a wonderful difference in my grades, because I had almost all A's the rest sure, of the way. Right. And, uh, Finished there and I got a job with uh, Western Electric in Burlington, North Carolina. And they were the manufacturer and I guess the prime contractor for the Nike missile system, which was our country's first uh, defense, missile defense system. And uh, I really enjoyed that work and I did well. And then I got, uh, and I got promoted and salary raises, but then after about four years, I got this feeling that I ought to be doing something else. And I was looking after the uh, senior high youth program at the church where I attended, and they even offered me the, the position as director of Christian education. But I thought, well, I have no education in that direction. And uh, it seemed like a dead end to me. So I did go back to North Carolina State and started my master's program, which I finished in 1959. And th that was a time when Colleges were just beginning to require a PhD if you wanted to go to the professor ranks. So when I finished my, uh, my master's degree, I spent the summer working for Hughes Aircraft in California. Oh, Hughes Aircraft? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And uh, just a summer job, and it was a nice... Did your family go with you? Family went with me, yeah. and so we spent weekends camping and things sure. like that. And uh, they had promised me that once I got my master's degree that I would start me on the professor route. Well, I got back to the end of that summer and uh, the university had changed its mind. And so I became a full-time instructor. And uh, I realized that I wasn't going up the ladder anywhere as a professor unless I got a PhD. So I applied for, I, I looked for different jobs. I interviewed IBM, for example, and a few others. and. Uh, I applied for a fellowship, and I got a Ford Foundation fellowship to Purdue University. And so I came here in uh, 60, June of 60, and in the spring of 63, I finished my PhD. And I looked around for other opportunities, and uh, had well, NC State offered me a job to come back to the University of uh, 
University of South Carolina in Columbia offered me a job and I had some other nibbles here and there. And I decided this was a great place because uh, my son was asthmatic and this climate agreed with him far better than anything in the South. Yeah, uh -huh. There's a lot of mold and stuff like that. So uh, that's basically the story of how What I was the campus like when you came? Then? Well, much smaller. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, right. I, th I think the enrollment was about 16,000. Okay. 14 to 16. Well, whereabouts and whereabouts did you live? Now, how many uh, children did you have? I had uh, two children. Okay. And uh, we started out out here at the marriage student courts. Okay. Stayed there for about probably a year and then moved to an apartment down on Chauncey Street, <coughs> south of uh, State Street there. Sure. Lived there for a year. And then got a place out on Lincoln Street, <coughs> that little uh, street off right. of Rose Street, roughly between Rose and it's off of Granite, kind of cuts in around yeah. there. I know. Uh -huh. And that, that was a little house, and it was it was certainly livable, a nice place to live. And handy, and, too. And quiet. It was handy. It was easy to walk through. And uh, then in 65, a house came on the market on Robinson Street, which was a nice house, old house, steam heat, well built. And we bought that, and we lived there until 1988 when we built a house out in the country. Oh, okay. <laughs> All righty. Let's talk a little bit about uh, you and the electrical engineering. Your research focus and teaching is your first love. Uh, yeah. yeah, teaching was my first love. Research was in uh, semiconductors, solid state, sure. things like that. And, uh, that. That was fun. We had some interesting time with our graduate students there. And, uh, we didn't... Uh, didn't get any Nobel Prizes or anything like that. Who was the head when, when you came? When I came, Tom Jones oh, was the there. head. And Tom uh, moved from here to be the president of the University of South Carolina. Hmm. And uh, I and another Ford Foundation student interviewed down there before we decided what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom then uh, went back to MIT. He had been at MIT, and I think he went back as provost, as I recall. And I believe that Bill Haight was an interim head then for a year or two. And um, well, then Haight, and then did John, then John Hancock came. John Hancock then. Right, yeah, was, was about 65. Head, yeah, and he, he took over. And then uh, Ben, I believe it was Ben Coates became right. head after him. And then after him was uh, there was a Bernard Hofflinger. Yeah, Hofflinger. Yeah, right. he was next. And but he what well, didn't, didn't stay too long, or did he? I'm not sure. No. Uh, and then Dick Schwartz came in. Yeah, uh, Hofflinger. He came from Minnesota, didn't he? I don't know where he Wisconsin came from. Something from. But but he didn't suit the folks here. Uh, the, the folks in or some of the folks in Double E were very outspoken and uh, wanted free reign to do about whatever they want to, and. Uh, some were, some of them were bad boys. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Got in some trouble. Okay. And, okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, Hefflinger left, and then uh, Dick Schwartz took over until he was dean, and then I, I guess uh, Dave Landry was an acting head. Right. In the meantime, the left. Let's talk about you were assistant head for instruction. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about that. Okay. Uh, some of your initiatives in the and were you involved in the co-op program too? Oh, yeah. did before, before I became assistant head, uh -huh. uh, I developed our our counseling program uh, because we started this curriculum where students could, within reason, plan their own course of study, and that meant that we had to help them do this because we weren't giving them a list of thou shalt take all these courses sure. when you're done you can leave, and so. Uh, along with that, I had the co-op program. I think I was responsible for that for about nine years. And uh, I guess, uh, I think Larry Ogburn followed me in that, and Jeff Gray took it over. He's uh -huh. been there ever since. But uh, that, that was a, a lot of fun. We had uh, a nice association there. And then when I became assistant head, uh, it was sort of a jack-of-all-trades kind of thing. I had responsibility for making out the setting up the courses like my gym did for years and I had responsibility for making the teaching assignments uh, uh, for the faculty and then for the TAs as well and uh, that was an interesting challenge because they began to require international students to prove their speaking ability before I could hire them as a TA and I can understand that 
and uh, you know, we always had far more foreign students who wanted to be TAs than who were qualified. And uh, about that time, there were a lot of professors around the country getting shot by members of their committee when they didn't like the way things were going. So I always worked very hard to be even-handed and help the students out wherever I could. But you know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to break any rules for you because that's that's what the job is for. You sure. have to make tough decisions, but uh, but but that was a lot of fun. I, and I was I was a, one of the faculty advisors to Ada Kappa Nu, the honorary society, mm -hmm. and that was that was. Uh, How did the co-op program? Are there peaks and valleys with that? As far as uh, no, yeah, uh, during during the very beginning of my time as assistant head, our enrollment, undergraduate enrollment went well beyond what we could handle. It went up to 1,523, I think, was, was the maximum. And uh, at that time, I think I had 135 co-op students uh, in various places all over. And then we took That takes a lot of... Uh, oh, oh, yes, it really yeah. did. And I didn't do nearly as much traveling as I could have and maybe should have because there was plenty to do back home. That's I just, right. just couldn't break away. But uh, then we took measures to curtail the enrollment, and we started doing a variety of things to cut back. Because our goal was to get down to 1,200, and eventually it was to get down to 1,000 undergraduates. And uh, we, we did. We, we did away with some of the 3-2 programs that Purdue Engineering had with sure. schools around the state in particular. And, uh, and then it got down to where my uh, my co-op numbers were about 100, so we were down to, you know, 30 to 35. Did you recruit a lot from Indiana? Of course, those companies, your manufacturing, your auto industry has changed a lot over time. Yeah, uh, we, we had a lot of folks with General, uh, General, General Motors. Motors and uh, with General Electric in various places, including Fort Wayne, they had a small motors division up there. And of course, we had Caterpillar and, <coughs> Caterpillar and John Deere over in uh, Illinois. Sure. Iowa, and uh, uh, what, what, what else? We, we had some activity down in the Bloomington area, and I think that was with RCA. But there wasn't RCA much moved out, yeah. yeah. There wasn't much technical stuff going on there, and we even had with the the uh, the wire company that was out at Union Street. Oh, that Peerless Black. Wire. Or peerless, I think peerless yeah. or something like right, that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We had a couple students there. That didn't work out very well because it didn't have much engineering going on. Sure. There, you know. Right. And then uh, you know we had uh, Schlumberger and you know, in California we had a lot with Hughes out there and uh, Honeywell and uh, all over the place. Did you do some Westinghouse too? Uh, Westinghouse used to have a, a one in Michigan, I think, or one of their big. Spots. I don't remember oh, having okay. anybody in Westinghouse, but we had a number that were working in two or three different places on the design and building of uh, nuclear power plants, and that was that was always disappointing for them because they spent most of their time making engineering changes dictated by the Nuclear Reg Regulatory Commission. <laughs> <laughs> Not too much free willing. Yeah. Let's talk about committees. The University Senate, of which you were the Chair. I was a chair. Yeah, and then I'll talk a little bit also about the Presidential Search Committee for the replacement of uh, Dr. Hansen, you were the chair. Yeah, uh, uh, my tour of office, I guess, started in, sep <laughs> started in September. and uh, As the chair? As the chair. <laughs> and uh, there were the usual turmoil going on campus of various things. And uh, I, I really I really cared a lot for uh, Art Hansen. Uh, he, and, he and I were he was friend. a student. He was just always around. Yeah, he was you very saw him good in the friend. union. I could walk across campus and, and with him and talk about things. And uh, there was a, a tumult around here because somebody, some student had, I don't know, maybe drunk for all I know, walked out in front of the car and got badly hurt or something. And so there was a hue and cry to do something so that students could get across State Street safely. And one of the plans that the students were putting up was. Uh, bridge and a walkway across and uh, so somebody set up with uh, the local TV station an interview with me and it was uh, it was early in the morning I'd say early nine o'clock I guess 
of the day we were having a Senate meeting, and I had been tipped off beforehand that President Hansen was resigning. And so I went to this interview, and they talked about all the safety and all this kind of thing. And I'm standing there talking and thinking to myself, you know, by 2 o'clock this afternoon, this story will be worthless, and you're not even going to put it on TV, which right. was the case. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, the, the uh, composition of the Presidential Search Committee was dictated by the rules of, of the Senate. And uh, we must have had... <coughs> Wasn't the trustees involved in that, uh, as far as the appointment of trustees involved in any of the appointing uh, of the people or not? No, no. trustees okay. were not involved at all. Uh, well, except they did have discussions with me. Okay. And, uh, but as far as the composition of the committee was Senate? No, that, that was all dictated by, by the Senate. So we had a good committee, and uh, they, we had representation from the regional campuses, too, because that was, that was a part sure. of the plan. And so I met with uh, Don Powers, who was head of the trustees He's the chair at that of the board. time. And uh, I met with him and uh, two other trustees in the union on Sunday after this. And, uh, they, and this was early no, either late October, early November, I remember the date. But they asked us to put together a list of 25 candidates and present them to the Board of Trustees by the 15th of February. And so uh, we were supposed to you know, announce it all over the world and get applications and sure. determine suitability and whether they would likely be willing to move and all that. And so we worked very hard that, that winter. And that was a winter when we kept having snow. And I remember walking to these meetings and we not only met we met several times a day at times, including in the evening and I walk across dark northwestern stumbling over the snow. But uh, uh, and we made a lot of calls to talk to the potential candidate and we put together the list and uh, my entire committee met with the trustees. All of the trustees? All the trustees. In a, in the room in the union, which was off campus. It was defined as off campus because they could serve booze in there. You probably are aware of that. <laughs> and and uh, we made our presentation, and then it was basically out of our hands. And of course- How, Did you have to make it for everybody that you had, or did you narrow it down? to the candidate uh, list. We gave them the entire list. Oh. I, th I think we may have highlighted what we considered the top I 10 see. candidates. Okay. I, I believe that was what it was. And uh, we basically handed it off to the trustees and they got busy. Well, a lot of things happened in a search like this. Some people had agreed to put their name in so they could twist some arms back home and get a raise. That, that always happened. Uh, some people got spooked and said, no, they really weren't interested. And so, uh, and the trustees then talked to a number of people, and uh, the list basically disappeared. It was non-existent anymore. None of those people were, who we and the trustees felt might be qualified were interested anymore. And so at that time, it was, gee, what do we do? And so the trustees hired a, uh, a search outfit. Headhunters, I think, is a vernacular term for right, it. Yeah. And uh, they began looking around, and we still had we still had some some people in the pipeline. I just about forget about that. But uh, Don Powers and I uh, flew several places. He had a he had a nice airplane, and he's a pilot, and I'm a pilot. So we flew out to Nebraska one day and talked to sure. a fellow there, who I think was a provost at that time, and. Uh, it, they narrowed it down and whittled it down, and then finally some people said, well, uh, Steve Bearing, who was a dean of medical school, I guess, at that time, for Indiana University Medical School, uh, he's an interesting go-to guy. And so on a snowy day, uh, Don Powers and I flew down to Indianapolis in his plane, and uh, several of the trustees, including Anderson from Lafayette, were already down there. And it, I guess maybe an athletic club down on the circle. There was a nice yeah, the uh, probably the athletic club was yeah, or yeah. the Columbia Club, one or the other. Yeah, yeah. I don't know which one. Yeah. Was, we met and we had had a nice dinner and, and talked. And 
I remember about the time the, the meal was over and we were stretching and getting ready to ask some more questions, uh, uh, three of us guys went to the men's room and one said to me while we were in the men's room, he said, he's like a little Prussian general, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and so we were we were taken with him, and there was a guy also being entertained from somewhere in California, and I don't remember. I don't think it was USC. I don't think it was UCLA. I really don't remember where it was from. But uh, he had been here at the campus and been wine and dine, and uh, some of the trustees favored him. Uh, a lot of the folks uh, on the trust on the board of trustees and on my committee as well didn't like the idea of the president of a, a true university being a guy without a Ph.D. <laughs> and uh, uh, for most of us, if we felt if we could do the job, that's fine. We don't have any problem with that. Let me interrupt you. Right? Was it, you had an interim head. Is that when John Hicks was the interim? John Hicks was during, the interim. Yeah, you should mention yeah. it for the researchers during all of this time because Dr. Hansen yeah, had yeah, left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. John Hicks was doing I I love John Hicks. He was a great guy. Right. Mr. Baseball. I talked to Swifty here not long ago, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we were entertaining or certainly considering uh, Steve Baring at the time this other guy came here. And uh, some things that the some of the trustees said led me to believe that he would be the new president. Well, for whatever reason, that, that didn't work out. And uh, Baring was offered the job. And a lot of my committee weren't too crazy about having a medical doctor who didn't have a real, a real doctoral degree. <laughs> you know how professional people can be. <laughs> but uh, that was a good choice. I, I think the world of Steve and his wife, and uh, we still meet him once in a while down at uh, Trader Joe's. On people have so mentioned that we should have one in Lafayette. So it's been rumored for some time, but it just hasn't come to. I've been beating the bushes. I know people who tried. And, uh, matter of fact, and I was talking to Steve Berry about this down at uh, Trader Joe's, and he said that he didn't think the summer enrollment here was enough to make a go of it. Now, I don't really agree with that because, you know, this town used to be pretty quiet in the summertime, but it isn't that That's quiet. Right. And there's there's more people in the town now That's than right. over the years. That's right. A lot more people, and the, the graduate enrollment uh, total is, is far greater than it used to be. And so I think we can keep one here. It'll save me traveling. In and we'll out. keep but, pushing for it anyway. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Uh, let's talk. Let's see. And uh, one, one, one thing yeah. about this. Yeah, sorry. Uh, who all is going to listen to this, by the way? Uh, the researchers can listen to it, but they can also read the transcript. Oh, okay. Okay, you'll get a draft uh, transcript, and then to add it, and then we'll put it on. We don't put it on the website to use a Okay. Okay. Well, I, uh, w one of the things that I can. You want to leave this on the tape or not? If you can turn it off yeah, for a sure. second. Just yeah, that's all. Um, let's see. Um, the ethics advisor, could you make you you're still an ethics advisor? For I, that? I, I am an associate. I've been working for with the know, uh, nine or ten years with uh, uh, the one that uh, basically deals with, I'll say children, but the challenge is from something like three years old to 21 who have problems of some sort. Yeah, you've been working with the special services and assistive technology, right? That's, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, uh, is that at, um, do you? Go down to that uh, facility. It, it used to be at Wabash Center. Wabash, I was going to ask. And uh, that got changed, and now it's uh, it meets over at Linwood School, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, it's, it's this, uh, well, what's the group? Uh, Special Services uh, Wabash. I don't remember the name, but they go around with a bus and they collect a lot of these kids, and most of that gets done out of Linwood School. Okay. Well, at least to start with. Sure. And then uh, there's one girl that uh, I guess that we started with when she was maybe in seventh grade or something like that, or sixth grade, who had a communications problem and she couldn't speak and make known what she wanted. And so she had a little device and she could press a button and it would tell people what she wanted. And she had to carry this and her books with her. And so uh, the group started out trying to develop a cart first it would follow her around and they finally figured out that thing will run over you know <laughs> that's kind of a crazy way to go and so they were trying to make it so that, uh, uh, that she could follow it around and have a switch to make it go or not and, uh, some of our industrial folks 
went in and they said, well, can she push this cart around the way it is? Well, yeah, well, why don't you leave it at that? <laughs> so that's what they did. But uh, it was a great learning experience for our students. And uh, sure. uh, I'm sure it made the young lady who's now in junior high school at least and the folks that work with her happy that we were doing something. That's about. right, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see, school, double E, um, anything special you want to talk about, their curriculum, maybe your facilities, the labs that sort of grown over time? Well, our labs uh, are really populated with outstanding equipment, and that that's due to a, whole, a lot of things, uh, companies that okay. hire our graduate students, our undergraduate students, our co-op, uh, they want to help us be the best we can be. Right. And so they help with that. Got a nice network. We got a nice network there. And we got good maintenance people. We got good people who can use the equipment that we have to implement courses that help the students learn. Right. And uh, that, that's been a real plus. So I, I think our equipment is, is in, in good shape. All right. How long were you the assistant head for instruction? Uh, 14 years. Wow. Uh, from from early 80s until I retired, which was in 96. Okay. And uh, it was... That's a good, that's a good run. It was always interesting, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I always liked to come to work, especially then, at about 7 in the morning, because I could get on my email and stuff like that. Right. And I could get more done between 7 and 9 than I could the rest of the day when folks started coming in with problems. Right, and exactly. I hear you. <laughs> Uh, so let's talk about Fact Fellow. You were Fact okay, Fellow at yes. Allen Hall. Talk a little bit about that. That's changed a lot now. We were Fact Fellows in Tarkington. Yeah. And now that they've uh, centralized a lot of the eating, we miss. Yeah, the that, that's a real challenge. It is. Uh, yeah, we, I've been, my wife and I have been Fact Fellows at Owen for at least 35 years. But when we started, the enrollment was a lot lower than it is oh, now. Yeah. And it was an all male facility at that time. Right. And uh, we'd have a group of guys over Sunday evening for, for dinner and all that. And then they had, used to have that ice rink out there where the aquatic center now is. And uh, a lot of times I'd tell a bunch of these guys, a lot of them were in double E and then ME and so on. I said, oh, why don't you meet us over at the ice rink two deep? And uh, we and my wife and our daughter, who was high school age then, would go sure. over there and we'd skate around with these guys. And, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, the key to a successful fact fellow program is a counselor or what's now called an RA, a resident right. assistant. And if you've got a good one, and we've been fortunate to have a good one most of the time, then it's a good program. And you're right, having these uh, food courts makes it more of a challenge because when they could eat right in the facility where they live, it was much easier. If they knew you were coming, they'd save a spot, so there was always, you know, you, you could gather yeah. around. And they had more activities. We used to go over there for the Christmas, decoration of the doors, and then we, uh, they always had something for Halloween, and decorating the halls and things of that sort, and a lot of those activities are just Well, not that's very right. I, I, and uh, Owen used to have a uh, Madame Carol cruise up on Lake Oh, Freeman. really? They would go up there, and the, the, the fellow, Mark Weaver, who was guy in charge of the kitchen there. Uh, he'd take grills up there, we'd have big steak feed and get on the Madame Carol and steam <laughs> up and down. <laughs> we never did that. I should I should thought, thought about that. That's yeah. pretty good. Yeah, there were there were a lot of things like that and we had to, at the beginning of school we'd have a canoe race down the tip of canoe river and all that. But you're right about your comment. Some years the uh, the the head on the hall was just get everything together then the other years it just they wouldn't let us know what was going on yeah. and then they wondered why you're not coming. We didn't know that, that this effect you know, was was really going on. Yeah. So. Yeah, we we had we didn't have a good experience last year. Uh, we had a young girl whom we'd also had the year before, and uh, she was she was reasonably good. Uh, but then last year she was uh, a little smart mouth and figured that she knew everything, and so a lot of things she wouldn't do the way we wanted to do and the way we knew was successful in the past. And uh, she's she's. Uh, trying to finish up her degree. And so, but the gal we got this year is just super. I, I'd do it for another 100 years if I knew I had somebody. You get like one that. or two of those and it really takes the edge off, you know? Yeah, right. we, we may give it up this year because, uh, you know, it, it, if you add that obligation one night a week plus some added things to everything else you do, then. I know, it, it's uh, jam-packed. You How never, about get, never get to take an afternoon nap. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> the hundredth anniversary. That was pretty neat. You had yeah, a lot of activities, yeah. Yeah, and you 19, sort of were helping with that. Eighty-eight. There well, you go. Yeah, right. That was, that was a lot of fun. We had a big celebration. Yeah, and lots of people and cornerstone put in place and all that. Yeah, that was. That was That's kind of fun. Yeah. All right. Um, family. Uh, tell us, did your children go to Purdue? Uh, yes. Oh. Uh, son went. Son went through electrical engineering with that honors program I mentioned. He basically finished since he had good credentials from West Lafayette High School and got some advanced credits. He basically was finishing his electrical engineering program in three years. And at that time, they were starting to talk about sea grant universities, like like land grant universities. Right. And uh, that was beginning to fade, and so he began to think, well, all I'd ever be was a high school biology teacher, nothing wrong with that, but he wasn't interested in that. And so he decided on medical school. And so he went to IU Medical School, graduated from there. We were married uh, by the time he graduated, I guess, and then they went up to Minneapolis, and he was uh, doing his residency there and finished that. And, and what then, area was he interested in? Uh, okay. Pathology. Okay. Yeah, blood work, hematology sure. uh, primarily. Right. And by that time they had the two children, which is a total number of children. And they moved to Dallas, Fort Worth area, and they were there for a while, three or four years. And then uh, they moved to Denver, and that's where they've been ever since. So they like it there. He was in the University of Denver Hospital, University of Colorado, and doing very well. He did some teaching as, as well as, uh, you know, practicing his trade. And then a few years ago, an outfit uh, offered him made him an offer he couldn't refuse, as they say, and they significantly upped his pay, and I had no idea what it is. I never asked, but anyhow, they're not on the leaf. And uh, he and he's, does tissue identification and blood matching and things like that, and he really enjoys the work. And, uh, Good. His, uh, his uh, son, who is the older of the two children, hasn't finished college. Uh, I think they, th I think his wife thought that he had some health problems when he was growing up and in my opinion she helped him along life's way too much taking up for him and helping him with his stuff so that he never developed the stick to activity skills if you know what I mean. But, uh, yeah. but uh, and he's working with Dick Sporting Goods in Denver and he's going to school uh, several classes a semester, so he'll eventually finish. The daughter uh, finished uh, nursing school. Out this in, is your uh, son's daughter. Yeah, my uh -huh. son's daughter out in California, and then uh, she spent a year or two years nursing up near Iowa City because her boyfriend uh, was in school up there at uh, Dork University or something like that, and. Uh, once he finished there, then they were married, and then he's wanted to go to medical school. So they're out in California, and she's working a nurse, and he's a student, a medical student at Loma Linda University, and uh, so that that's going well. She she's a smart gal. I, <laughs> she wanted me to go with her to buy a car because uh, this is like three Christmases ago, and uh, I said okay, fine, I'll be glad to. And so she looked around here and there, and she finally settled on a Subaru, and we went in the office to settle the deal, and, and they were trying to sell her long-term care and all this kind of stuff for the car, and I, I kept turning that down, and, <laughs> and, and once, once it settled on the, uh, what the deal was going to be, and talked about the down payment, the monthly payment, she got on her little laptop computer, transferred funds right there from her savings account to her checking account and wrote them out a check for a down payment. I thought, hallelujah, she's got a good head on her. <laughs> <laughs> so uh -huh. they're, they're doing well. Yeah. And uh, they went on a they went on a five week mission trip to Chad in the middle of Africa this summer. So they're they're thinking about that kind of stuff as medical missionaries. Sure. And uh, uh, they when will he is he almost finished? No, he's yeah. in his second year now, oh, okay. so he, he's got a way to go. Okay. So, so they're doing fine. My daughter, our daughter, has two children. Did she also go to Purdue, your uh, daughter? Oh, yeah, yes, I'm sorry. Okay. She started out 
at Drake University oh, okay. in, in Iowa. Iowa. And, then, and she'd been playing piano and viola, which was a lesson, or the, the instrument of her choice for years. And so she decided she wanted to go into music, which is a tough choice because you can starve to death being a musician. So she came back to IU and the practicing was so intense that she developed very severe tendonitis in her finger and hand. And uh, I think she finally decided, yeah, this is not going to be a good future for me. So she came back to Purdue, uh, finished a degree in history, went to work for Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati and worked there about three years. Came back here and got her MBA, uh, met the guy that she married, and uh, he was working for, I'll think of the name in a little bit, it's a construction firm, uh, Panco. You may recognize the name because he was a Purdue student. He made a lot of donations to the Civil Engineering School. And uh, so Dave, her husband, was working for them, him, that company. And uh, they were doing well. And then at the young age of 40 years old, he developed cancer. He never smoked a day in his life, so that wasn't it. And they learned about this in February. And six months later, he was dead and uh, left her with two young children. Uh, the daughter must have been six and the boy about eight or thereabouts. And she, well, she had the MBA and uh, early on before she had children, she was one of the fundraisers for Whittier College out there in California. But that took a lot of travel. And so she decided that uh, she was, and she'd already started a graduate degree in counseling, school counseling before her husband ever got sick. And uh, she figured, well, I can do that job and be at home with kids most of the time. And so uh, he died 10 years ago or thereabout. And uh, so she went ahead and over several semesters finished that degree. And she's been a counselor at an inner city school in Long Beach with about 1,000 to 1,200 students, mm -hmm. inner city type students. So it's a real challenge. And, That's uh, a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, the, the boy graduated from high school two years ago. He's a bright kid. If he worked hard, he's been all A's. Well, he was pretty close to all A's anyway, but he didn't work as hard as he could. He's now a student at uh, Occidental College mm -hmm. near Pasadena, California, and doing well. When he concentrates, he can do extremely well. <coughs> Uh, the granddaughter graduated this past year, this past June, and she's she, she has to work a little harder than he does, but she's a good student. And so in a sense, uh, she's better equipped to work than he is. And she sent out her applications for uh, college, and she got admitted all over the place, uh, including Glasgow University in Scotland, St. <laughs> Andrew in Scotland. And Go there for the golf. <laughs> And, and she's not interested in golf. I don't know, I don't know why she settled on that. But anyway, uh, she she decided then since the uh, one of the civic organizations in California has an exchange program with Brazil, and so she got uh, I'll call it a scholarship. It's basically a full ride year abroad uh, to to live in near. Near San Paulo, I'll say near, it's about 250 miles northwest of San Paulo. And she'll live with a family for like five weeks and then they move to another family and they get some travel involved and all that. And so she asked several of these schools if she could take a delay on admission. She knew that the scholarship might or might not be there a year from now, <coughs> but that, that was okay. In the meantime, she called me just before she left to go to Brazil and asked me what I knew about McGill University. And I said, that is a fine school. In Canada. In Canada, yeah, up in Montreal. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure she has applied and probably been admitted there. And one of the reasons is, and this will tell you what kind of good head she's got on her shoulder, she's got a certain amount of money that was put aside for her to go to college. But if she stayed in this country and went to Barnard or some of these uh, places like that, when she finished, she wouldn't have any money left. And she found out that she could go to McGill in Canada 
a whole lot less money. And uh, so, and it's an outstanding school anyway. So sure. at least that, the last I talked to her, that was what she was doing. That sounds good. And she's working hard trying to learn enough Portuguese to learn them schools down there. <laughs> I didn't know this, but Portuguese is a fairly difficult language by comparison to Spanish. I always thought it was pretty close. I've heard that from others, too. It's not an easy language to learn. It's not an easy language to learn, so so she'll be all right. (laughs) (laughs) Awards and honors. You got the Outstanding Electrical Engineering Professor from Kappa Nu. Any other awards that uh, you'd like to share with us come to mind? Not really. I had a wonderful surprise here a few weeks ago. One of my former undergraduate students, and I won't list the name because of the situation here, uh, gave a gift to Purdue in my honor. And uh, Is this for a scholarship in your name? It's just a, a, an unrestricted gift to the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering uh, to honor me, and electrical engineering can do whatever they want to if they want to award this scholarship. That's Wonderful. Fine. And uh, that never happened to me before, and I feel very honored because this is an outstanding young man. Uh, he's, he is a medical doctor. And, uh, That's very he's, nice. And he's, uh, he's a significant part of the medical community where he lives. And I won't say more about okay. that. Okay, sounds good. Very that, nice. That, that, was, that gave me a good warm feeling. <laughs> um, hobbies and special interests, aviation. Do you still have your own, you have your own plane? No, I, oh. I, uh, I was a part of the... Uh, Purdue Staff Aero Club for a long time. Okay. And I think you interviewed Jim Blakesley sometime. Before. I haven't done, Jim's on my, uh, we haven't, I haven't gotten, been able to interview him yet, but he's on my advisory committee. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. But I've invited some people in over. In well, he and a couple of others okay. put together that club, and over the years we always had three airplanes, a, a four place that do 130 miles an hour, a four place for about 155, and a, a six place retractable that would do 190. And uh, we've done a lot of interest in flying. And finally, the membership sort of decayed. Uh, some people bought their own planes. Some people gave it up. So I finally sold the last of those planes probably four years ago. And so I belong to the Purdue Pilots Club, which is mostly student, but there's some faculty in there too. Sure. And uh, I don't n- use it nearly as much as I used to because when my son was in Minneapolis, it was an easy flight up there in any one of the three planes, and we'd go up there every six or eight weeks. And uh, I've flown to Denver. Matter of fact, we've flown to Mexico, to the West Coast, to Maine, uh, Canada a bunch of times. So it's just been a, a great ride, and I really enjoy it. But since I don't have a whole lot of reason to do anything significant now, then we, Not doing as much, right? We, we go practice to stay current and legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> oh, dear. You've been uh, a couple of things in the community, particularly the big brothers and big sisters. You've been. Yeah, I had, a, I had a young Do you still have that? Uh, uh, no. Well, one, once, uh, once these folks get to be teenagers, oh, okay. they get busy. And I, I, keep, I keep in touch with him because uh, this boy, a real fine fellow, uh, he graduated from high school two years ago. And he went to uh, St. Joe, I think, up in northern Indiana, first year on a uh, football scholarship. He had a lot of athletic ability. And I got to get, I try to get together with him two or three times a year when he's in town. We sure. And, eat. and uh, he was going to transfer to IU. Uh, he, wanted to, he wanted to be in the athletic administration, I think, eventually. Uh-huh. And I've got to call him on Thanksgiving and see if he's in town. I've got his cell phone so I can, or his number so I can find him. Are you still active with the organization? No, I'm oh, you're not. not. Okay. No, too many other things. Oh, I know. Time. That's right. And then the your Explorer Scout. Are you still an advisor with them? Uh, no, oh. that uh, like like many things that comes and goes. <clears throat> right. I started this post '99, which was kind of sponsored by a Covenant Presbyterian Church to start with. And, uh, Bob Peart, who was in ag engineering, was my co-advisor. And we had a, a post that was largely an outdoor post. We did a lot of canoeing and camping and hiking and things like that. And that was a lot of fun. I, I worked with that for about eight years. I took a group of combination of scouts and explorer scouts out to the Philmont Scout Ranch in New Mexico one year, and that was great fun. So uh, that 
Yeah, yeah, that's an enjoyable thing. Yeah, and it's a good organization. That's right. You get all your exercise that way too, right? Yeah, yeah we got a lot of exercise. <laughs> uh, are you still on the board of directors at the museums at Prophetstown? Are you still? Uh, no, no. Oh. I was. Uh, there's a limit on how long you can oh, stay. I, I haven't been all that involved because I got other things, uh, activities. Uh, I'm sort of a go-to person for certain things at my church. I take care of the mowing. We got a big four acre lot out there and I do that. I've got an issue with the parking lot lights that uh, we got to get that fixed up. And for Habitat for Humanity, I've been working for them for probably five years now because mm -hmm. uh, at any one time they have quite a few lots, some of them quite large, that are not built on. And so uh, one day a week during the summer I go out and put their big mower on their trailer and their pickup and go around and spend about, uh, about six hours mowing what recently has been ten lots all over all over Lafayette and so they had some lots down in Stockwell and those are built on now so we used to go down there so, mm -hmm. so that uh, keeps me That's very good. out of trouble. One day so your retirement activities you're pretty busy oh, and yeah. you're still teaching of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Teach you both semesters? Yeah. I, I'm probably going to take a sabbatical in the spring that would go. Um, that Explorer Scout post introduced me to skiing, and I drug my wife and kids up to northern Indiana the, the week after that, and this was January, late January, and the weather was down about 10 degrees, and I insisted that they learn how to ski, and so my wife and I have been going to Steamboat Springs, Colorado, well, in New Mexico and other places, but yeah. we sort of got stuck on a steamboat for probably the last 20 years. And uh, this may be the last year that we do that. We're going out in late January. Uh, part of the cost is so ridiculously high. And the place we stay belongs to a good friend of mine. I get a so-called uh, owner's referral discount, but it doesn't amount to much. And they keep going up on the price. Mm -hmm. and, it's pretty pricey. And you know, at my age, I'm not, don't, I'm not quite as daring as I used to be anyway, and I don't want to get out there and get killed. I, I <laughs> we're going to avoid that. I'll see you when you get back. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we can go up into Michigan and ski for a day or two, and it's close by and doesn't cost all that much Right. <laughs> uh, any closing uh, comments or things I forgot no, to ask? No, I really enjoyed Purdue, still enjoy Purdue, and uh, it, it's been a great part of my life. Uh, in addition to all these other things, we do a lot of gardening, and we have a five-acre place where we built this house in 1988, and that uh, keeps us busy because uh, I think the trees grew more leaves this summer than I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to thank you, Dr. Oh, Tom. This I, is very.